that's for now. We we work in the portfolio that I was I was a customer from these very customers. So is this going to work, Kimo? Yeah. So we'll go ahead and start. Um, welcome, everyone. We have a few people online as well. Uh, thank Deep C I O I A I. Sorry, for uh, for hosting and providing the food. Um, we hope this is a good start for us. We're going to try to do in person meetups, which is new for us since COVID. It's been a two years we haven't really been doing meetups uh, in person, but we're going to try to do the com combine Zoom and do in person at the same time. Again, it's going to be uh, the second Wednesday of the month. We have one scheduled for next month as well. And if anyone, we always like local presenters, and we'll also do if you're remote, you could do it online. Um, just message one of us, uh, one of the organizers of Meetup, and uh, we'll get you scheduled. There is a paper call link that I'll put in the uh, on the page later on where you can submit submit a, a proposal for a presentation. Uh, also, uh, just as a service to the community, you know, it's kind of a bad time, a lot of layoffs going on. So if you are hiring, um, please message us, uh, and we will we'll send out a, a an email to the group. Um, but with that, let's go ahead and Thomas Bell's got a great presentation for us on Istio. So we'll turn the time over to him. Well, it's a presentation. <laughs> I'll let you guys decide if it's great. Um, so thanks everyone for coming and uh, thanks Brett for helping put it together. Um, for those who just came in, there's pizza in the back if you want any and drinks, feel free to get up and get grab it if you want. Um, <clears throat> And chemo is running our AV, so thanks a lot for that, uh, chemo. Really appreciate it. So, yeah, so uh, thanks everyone for joining. And we're going to talk about service meshes today and kind of why we have them and, and why they're important. And, uh, and then we're going to get into some details about a particular service mesh. There's a lot of service meshes out there, but Istio is the uh, one that we'll kind of talk about. And we'll do, I'll attempt to do a demo if the gods shine upon me. And, uh, before we jump into that, just a little bit about me, because um, that is one of my favorite topics. If I can, uh, let's see, how do I, there we go. So um, I'm one of the infrastructure engineers here at Deep Sea, who's hosting. Uh, we're an AI company that focuses on building uh, AI solutions for financial services companies. And uh, we're a series A company, so we're still a startup, but been around, I've been with the company for just about, uh, just a little over a year. and. Um, the company's been around for a few years. And uh, I, I sort of lead the infrastructure um, and automation team here. And um, we build, um, we have we have a multi-tenant architecture and we have, we leverage Kubernetes and AWS and um, all those uh, cloud goodies. Um, and I've also have a background in other companies. I've worked for Papa John's Pizza. You guys may have heard of them. Uh, for a while, I was director of DevOps for them. So. Uh, seen seen a few different um, approaches to infrastructure and how it's kind of evolved over the years. Um, if you want to check me out on GitHub, you can take a picture of that. Um, I don't have any other social media except GitHub. So if you want to check me out there, I'd love to connect or feel free to reach out on my personal email, which is at thomas at thomasbell.io or uh, thomas.bell at deepsea.ai. Either one works. So if you guys have any questions or just want to talk shop at any point, uh, feel free to reach out. I'm happy to do that always. So, and I'll probably be sitting for most of this because uh, I have a bit of a back issue. So uh, please don't consider me rude while I do that. Um, so let's talk a little bit about uh, the agenda. One actually thing is if you have questions as we go, please feel free to um, speak up. We don't have to wait till the end, but uh, we don't have to be too formal about it. Uh, I wanted to talk, before we jump into like the actual technology, I want to talk a little bit about um, why we need microservices. Because if anybody has been around for a while knows that we didn't start there, but then if you've been around long enough, you know that we actually did start there uh, with microservices. Um, and you, uh, you kind of start to ask, you kind of have to ask the question, why are we here? Why, why do we need microservices? Why do we need these new technologies like Kubernetes? Why do we need service meshes to uh, facilitate microservices architecture? So I want to talk a little bit about that and it's kind of the evolution and 
uh, why we're where we are uh, today as a um, as sort of a technology community. Because it's important to ask that question because we oftentimes get kind of narrowly focused on the technology and forget that uh, we're all doing this in service to a uh, an objective for an organization. Um, and we want to talk about like how those microservices have kind of changed architecture and infrastructure needs for um, for companies and um, and the challenges that come along with those because there's a lot of challenges and if well I know I do because um, I'm in it every day sometimes I constantly ask myself the question why don't we just have websites <laughs> why don't we need microservices um, and then I'm going to talk about uh, service meshes in general and kind of how they came about and and where they sit within the whole infrastructure ecosystem and the sort of abstraction hierarchy um, and then i'll talk uh, in detail about istio and i'll like i said i'll demo a, a small piece of istio um, today just kind of hopefully demonstrate some of the power that uh, comes along with it so let's talk about the good old days back in the good old days you had one it guy and um, he could manage the in-tier architecture, which was the cutting edge at the time. You had like a web server that just sat in a secure network somewhere. Um, you had a database. If you, uh, most companies get by with MySQL. If you really had to scale, you paid Oracle $2 million a year and they, uh, they solved all your problems. And then um, you might have a batch data processing job or something that runs and grabs that data from that database and then puts it into some ERP system like SAP. And that was kind of the way it worked for a long time. Um, and this was good for the IT guy. He was a pretty cool dude. Sometimes you had to like, you know, hear him go on and on about his waifu problems, but, um, but mostly he's a pretty cool dude. And he managed the whole thing. Maybe you have a few web developers do, do the thing and um, you have a firewall at the end and everything's secure, everyone's happy. And the company's happy because this whole architecture ain't much different from uh, buying a piece of capital equipment or something like that. This is just kind of really straightforward and, and simple and everything kind of gets solved. So you don't need service meshes. You don't need Kubernetes. You don't need containers. You don't need anything to manage this system. So the question begs itself, like why uh, don't we still just do it that way? And that's a good question. And honestly, if, depending on the scale of your company and what you're trying to achieve, uh, doing it that way is probably not a bad strategy. Um, you definitely don't need to start with Kubernetes necessarily, although sometimes in a startup or Istio or service meshes, you don't need to start there um, unless you kind of know where you're headed. And sometimes uh, the adoption of those technologies comes too late in companies, actually. Um, they should start earlier, but they don't realize that all the time. But what changed? Well, over the last 20 years, we got the web scale, um, which is more than just a buzzword. You know, we have uh, your your customer base, depending on your products can and your digital footprint can expand the whole globe. And you go from handling you know several thousand requests, and if you do really well, you have to handle several million. Um, so that that changed things. People adopted more and more on the digital space. You know, we went less and less towards. Uh, sort of traditional brick and mortar businesses. So we needed something that scales and uh, this doesn't scale um, because even if you wanted to, you can't even hire enough IT guys to scale this system at web scale, even if you wanted to. Um, the other thing is demand for real-time data insights. So web 2.0 really kind of changed the landscape when it came to marketing um, because it fundamentally changed how how, cust how companies started to engage with customers. And one of the things that they needed was real-time data. And that batch data processing that happened once a day, if you're lucky, maybe once a week, um, and it might take several hours, just wasn't cutting because you had to respond to digital trends and you know A-B test your application, all these things. So uh, as the demand for real-time insights went up, the uh, sort of infrastructure had to adapt and it had to be able to get that real-time data, which meant we had to have different models. We couldn't just have a relational database system that set um, in someone's closet somewhere. We had to have a, um, we had to have a constant stream of data to marketing team, to the operations team, to um, whoever. And then you add on top of that, the uh, internet of things, which is a very real thing, especially in your manufacturing context where you have constant 
data constantly uh, churning, and you got to figure out what to do with that data and, and leverage it to, um, you know, drive your drive your bottom line. And then the last thing is, as the cloud came to be, as AWS pioneered EC2 Classic, thank you for that, by the way, um, we started to see that uh, the barrier to entry got really low. So the thing is, this is actually relatively easy to manage. It's actually capitally pretty intensive for the cloud. Um, you know, you're talking 30, 40 grand probably for this setup for any sort of reasonably sized organization if you're running your own, your own hardware. But for startups with the uh, advent of the cloud and, um, and EC2, you know, the barrier to entry is very low. So startups, upstarts started upstarting, doing their thing, and they were able to get going on infrastructure for a pretty low cost initially, just to get up and going out the door and start trying out new ideas. So uh, larger companies had to adapt to that. And what that means is that they had to not just adapt their technology model, actually the technology model came second. What they had to do is adapt their human model, their um, basically how they organize teams. How We went to Agile, we went to Scrum, we went to Sprints, we went to um, uh, developers interfacing more directly with the, um, with the customers and the stakeholders. So that traditional infrastructure just had to change. And that's how come, that's why we're at, the microservices where we're, that's why we're at microservices now and i think that's that again i just wanted to reiterate that point before i jumped into the technology discussion because we have to sometimes step back and ask ourselves why and sometimes the answer is uh oh there's actually not a good reason and we have to always analyze that but microservices have a very good reason and actually i think even though it's third in the list i think actually the third one is probably the most important because microservices enable dynamic teams um, to scale effectively and of course, Netflix and uh, Spotify sort of pioneered that whole model um, in the last uh, couple of decades. So moving on from the sort of the abstract, let's talk about what it looked like um, in that in that world at a different from a different perspective. So away from the north south view and into well, what did, what did you do? You had the you have the networking layer, which is all about routing and IP addresses, firewall rules. You have someone that manages the firewall. And it's all about what can communicate from this IP to that IP on what port, et cetera. And in this world where you just have a few systems, uh, a web server, a database, an ERP, um, you know, that's easy. That's relatively easy to reason about. And it, the other thing is it, does, it didn't change very often. If it changed, you might buy a new product or something, like maybe the operations uh, team needs some new uh, data system or something and you spin that up, but that happens like maybe once a year or something like that. And the networking and the IT guys could easily respond to that without much trouble. So you have that networking layer and then everything kind of sits on top of that. So there's no abstraction at this point, basically. It's like, I need, there's not even DNS. I mean, back, not that long ago, 15 years ago, a lot of places didn't even use DNS. So it was kind of a new new idea. They would just literally communicate on IP addresses. So that changed though, as we got to microservices, we had to add a new abstraction tier um, called the orchestration layer. And those sort of concrete systems like a web server, an ERP, batch data processing, MySQL sort of came abstract. They became services that uh, lived on that orchestration layer. Um, so the orchestration layer is all about service discovery, it's scaling, scheduling, that's basically Kubernetes. Um, Kubernetes is not the only orchestration layer, obviously, but uh, it is sort of become the de facto standard, especially for containers um, in our world. But that's that's what happened. And now instead of, instead of applications and application teams having to worry about IP addresses and firewall rules and I mean, I don't know who here has experienced this, but if you've ever had to like deploy a new service into a uh, sort of a legacy company, um, you got to interface with the networking team. And the first question they're going to ask you is what IP address are you coming from? And the second question they're going to ask you is what IP address can you communicate with? And the first thing you're going to say is I have no idea. I don't know. I don't care about IP addresses. That's not my job. That's your job. <laughs> but uh that's not how it works. So we, we add the orchestration layer and now you have DNS. Service discovery is basically DNS more or less. Um, and that's cool. But we added complexity. We did add some complexity. Um, 
there, but we get a lot of flexibility in the, in the process. And you have that services tier where you have these services that are constantly uh, scaling up and scaling down and you have new things coming in all the time. You're, you're dynamically scaling for that web scale, et cetera. And that's been working pretty good for the last few years, not too bad, but we have some other challenges that aren't really addressed at the orchestration layer. And one of the reasons for that is that um, we're, we kind of move away from the world of nouns and into the world of verbs, kind of. Uh, we move away from, like most developers and actually much of the uh, IT world, I would argue, um, historically they've dealt with the nodes in the network. So each of those boxes is a node and, um, but the, there's communication pathways between all those services. And um, those would be called the edges. And we don't really think about the edges too much. Um, they kind of just happen all the time, but there's a bunch of really important things that happen at the edge. Um, just because services can discover each other with DNS and at the orchestration layer doesn't mean they should be able to, number one. It also doesn't mean that they should be able to communicate with each other. So how do you manage that? How do you make sure that the service one is it's reaching out to service three, but is it allowed to reach out to service three? Is that even something we want to happen? Um, is all that communication, it's going, one of the things if we go back to this is uh, the firewall there, that's your security. Um, you don't have, once you get past that firewall though, it's like, it's kind of everyone's, um, it's kind of a free for all. You can communicate to anything as long as you get past that firewall. As long as you can commit one of the uh, network engineers to uh, whitelist your IP address, then you're in, like Flynn, as they say. But we have to uh, figure out, is that communication between these services, even within a corporate network, is it encrypted? So the other service, so the intern school project isn't able to read traffic coming between um, critical services in your business. Um, is the service that's communicating really the service it claims to be? It says it's service one, but is it? I don't know. Uh, so we have to solve these problems. Uh, the other thing is uh, sort of uh, cascading failures. If anyone's been, been on a support on a, an incident call, um, you've probably experienced it, especially as microservices started to make their way, where a service is dying. It's like, oh, we're getting 500s here. And now all of a sudden the whole screen goes red. And you go, what happened? Well, what happened was this service that was dead um, kept getting DDoS. And then the other thing, it just, it just cascades basically. And there's ways to deal with these things. Um, and one of them, the encryption, TLS, that, that's something we all, you know, we say we want TLS. Okay, cool. How do you do that? Well, we got to get the application developers to uh, implement TLS in all their applications. Okay. Well, good luck. <laughs> uh, we also got to get, um, make sure that uh, we implement identity in the system uh, universally, and it's correct. It's implemented correctly. Uh, we got to make sure that we have good observability in our system. Um, resiliency, we have a circuit breaker pattern implemented. You guys probably heard about that. Um, but all these things are sort of, they're easy to value. They're not always easy to do. And they're especially not easy to do well and correctly. So, we need a way to do to deal with this. And basically that's where service meshes come in. The service mesh is a way to systematize these edges, to build a platform, a new layer, a mesh that sits on top of the services and allows us to think about that as a separate layer within the ecosystem. I didn't actually put it as a layer here because it's kind of hard to even reason about as a layer because it's not a layer. It's, a commu it's like the, the communication pathways between the nodes. So that's where service meshes come in. So a service mesh uh, basically allows you to abstract the edges, all those pieces that happen in between things. Um, allows you to uh, systematize that so that you can actually build it as though it's its own layer within your infrastructure, which means you can have a dedicated team that's responsible for mutual TLS, that's responsible for making sure that identity is done correctly in your system so that application developers can focus on the business problem instead of focusing on all these other non-functional requirements that have to 
be happen within a secure and compliant system. So that's what service meshes do for us. And uh, I'm going to jump into the details of Istio in particular, which is an example of a service mesh. And we'll kind of talk about how that happens at a practical level. Before I do that, does anyone have any questions or comments or you want to share your experience with dealing with network engineers? No offense. <laughs> uh, I, I actually love network engineers. I love networking, but man, it's a challenge when you're trying to solve a business problem and you got to talk to a network engineer. Um, so let's talk about Istio. So, okay, one of the things I kind of gloss over, first of all, who, who here has worked with Kubernetes? All right, so most of you. Um, let me just briefly, for some people that uh, maybe haven't, uh, just talk quickly about what Kubernetes is and what it does. So Kubernetes is, a, is basically a way to abstract away virtual machines into this abstraction we call compute so that you can deploy services onto this control plane called Kubernetes. And it handles all the things like scheduling your containers and scaling your VMs and these things and kind of does it dynamically. And a key part of Kubernetes ecosystem is something called a pod, which is really just a collection of containers. So is everyone familiar with containers and kind of what they are conceptually? So a pod in Kubernetes is just basically a grouping of containers that share a common network space. So anything within a pod um, has the same network that communicate over local host. So the reason I wanted to bring that up and mention it is because I'll kind of assume that we're talking about running the system on Kubernetes. And Istio, although it's not exclusive to Kubernetes, it kind of is um, much of the features that you get out of the box and capabilities are a derivative of you running Kubernetes at the orchestration layer. So, this is kind of the architecture of Istio. So basically you have in a pod, you originally you might have just one service. In fact, I probably should have had an original up here. I'll do that for the next time. But uh, so you have service A and service B. And in before the service mesh comes into place, they might just have a direct communication with each other. But Istio uh, changed that up a little bit. It kind of divides the system into two uh, logical units, the control plane and the data plane. And the control plane is just kind of where it manages things like certificates and, um, and configuration and making sure that everything's communicating to each other correctly. It's, it's, a, it's where you control things. It's where you tweak things. Um, the data plane is where um, all those controls that you put in place are enforced um, within that service mesh. And basically that's done through something called Envoy Proxy, which is a, uh, a service that sits right next to the, the service in a pod. So every pod gets a proxy, which I'll show you in a minute in the demo. And service A no longer directly communicates with anything. Everything it does, every communication that it has, it goes through that proxy in that, that sits right next to it in the pod. And that proxy communicates and is controlled by the control plane. So now all traffic goes, instead of going directly to service B from service A, it goes to the proxy. The proxy sends that traffic to service B. And then, uh, but the proxy only does it based on um, policy and rules and uh, certain uh, paradigms that you put in place um, at the control plane. And there's sort of three parts to the Istio control plane. Um, there's something... These are all plugins. You can actually extend this. Uh, Istio is very extensible as long as you are know how to write C++ and you and you don't mind doing that. <laughs> uh, it's very extensible. But uh, you have a pilot, which is kind of responsible for uh, the flow of traffic through the mesh. So it kind of helps you decide um, where traffic gets routed, how it gets routed, um, et cetera. And one of the powerful things with Istio that I'm not going to talk about too much in the demo because I didn't really have time to put a good uh, presentation on it together, but is uh, traffic management. And Pilot kind of sits right there and helps you do that. So for instance, if you want to do things like canary deployments where let's say you have a service you want to roll out, but you only want to send 10% of the traffic to it, Istio allows you to do that um, with just simple configuration and tweaks. What would normally be a pretty challenging endeavor if you wanted to do it without Istio it becomes trivial. Um, Citadel manages certificates, and this is, oh my gosh, so important. I can't even fathom. So 
Okay, I'm gonna show you in the demo. This one I'm gonna demo is the uh, mutual TLS and sort of how simple that is to set up and uh, kind of mind blowing considering um, what it takes if you don't have Istio. But uh, it also manages all of the certificates, the rotation, the renewals, all that stuff for you. So I just laugh sometimes when I, and I also like, I don't know if crying is the right word, but I, I think it's like kind of crazy how much money and productivity has been lost due to expired certificates. It kind of blows my mind. <laughs> uh, it's like, first thing, if you have an incident at work, first thing you should ask is, is the DNS server working? Second thing you should ask is, are the certificates expired? <laughs> um, it's usually one of those two things, 85% of the time. Um, and then Galley is just where all the configuration management lives, et cetera. So that's kind of the control plane. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit more about the data plane. So there's some other pieces in the data plane. So Envoy is sort of the key. It's, it's sort of the centerpiece of the whole thing. Um, but really, it's just the fact that all the traffic is going through proxies that are context aware of the service that they're proxying. And they're also context aware of the other services within the system because they're communicating with the Istio control plane. So the other pieces though that um, make up the data plane are ways, which I'll talk pretty, uh, I'll talk in detail here in a minute when we get into the demo, um, and virtual services. And the gateways, just kind of like what they sound like, they're kind of like the in entry point into uh, your system. And uh, the virtual services are where you do things like man like tweak routing and traffic control and those kind of things, like what services can get what load, et cetera. Like I said, I won't dig too much into those because I didn't have time to set that all up. And also, uh, oh my gosh, if we, if we dug into all the capabilities for Istio, we wouldn't have enough. I mean, honestly, we could probably do a, a talk on each of the capabilities for Istio. So I'll jump into those, but let me talk about the architecture that I'm going to show because I'm going to get into some YAML files and show you what those look like. And then we'll just actually show, show, show it working, hopefully. Um, so in Kubernetes, for those who aren't familiar, one of the core um, sort of containers within the system is something called a namespace. And namespace is just like a namespace in Java or C Sharp or anything like that. It's just a logical uh, grouping of uh, like systems and like services. And most of the time, Istio um, and its control plane lives in the Istio system namespace, but that's by convention, not by requirement. It's just kind of how it does it out of the box. Um, and right there in that Istio system namespace, which I'll show in a minute, is uh, just a plain old Kubernetes service, actually, with some Istio in it. Um, that's most often um, named the Istio ingress gateway. And that's kind of your load balancer. So that's where all the traffic comes into your cluster, into your service mesh is going to enter. And then Istio is going to intelligently, based on all the systems that have sort of registered with it, uh, decide where that traffic goes based on host headers, basically all the layer seven stuff that, you're, that you might be used to in a firewall, a layer seven firewall. Um, so you can do it based on whether it's TLS traffic, whether it's a certain domain name, whether it's a certain route, um, whether there's certain headers that are present, et cetera. And you can dynamically decide where that traffic gets routed based on that. And then within the actual services namespace, uh, Kubernetes has um, a default namespace. That's what comes out of the box with it usually. So I just put it there, but that's where your actual core business services might be living. And uh, there's a gateway that's an Istio construct uh, that gets deployed into the system. And it basically says, hey, Istio ingress gateway. I have this gateway. Here's the host I want you to listen for. And if you see anything with, that matches this, send it my way. And then the gateway, uh, Istio comes in at ingress gateway, then it goes to the gateway for the services that you're, you're fronting. And then it, uh, the gateway determines what virtual service it sends it to. And then finally, the, the virtual service routes it to the actual Kubernetes native service. And then, uh, and then finally, it gets to the pod that is being served behind that, uh, that service. So this is high level conceptual um, sort of architecture for, for how it works. And I'm gonna dig in and show this in practice, but before I do that, anybody have any questions or comments? You can hold your applause till the end, of course. Um, Okay, so let's jump into a demo. Before I do into the like the actual workings, I'm going to show you some YAML files. So bear with me just a minute, but I think it's important to uh, 
kind of see what's going on here. Let me see if I can drag this onto. Uh, oh, I guess I should have kept my screen, but just stopped doing that. I just need to stop my uh, PowerPoint. I don't want to do that. All right, escape still works. Cool. Here, I'm going to show you. I already have some stuff running here. So let me kind of show you what, what I got running. I'm going to move this uh, annoying Zoom window out of the way. And uh, show you my real good. That was good. Yeah. Try to be easy to see. All right. So first, I'm going to show you um, what's running in the in this cube cluster. I have this running locally using Minikube, uh, which is just a, it's a great way if you're not familiar too much with Kubernetes to get started with it. Um, and you can just run it locally. It's really straightforward and easy to get going. Oh yeah, for sure. Thanks for reminding me that. Yeah. Yeah, it's easier if I do that though, probably. Uh, okay, so here in this uh, kube cluster, I have a few namespaces. Really, the only ones we care about right now are default and Istio system. Um, is that big enough, by the way? Brett, you able to see that? Or, yeah, okay. Um, let me show you what's running in Istio system. So, first, I'm going to look at the pods. So, well, we have. Uh, let me just pipe, let me grab for Istio because it has some other things that'll be part of the demo later, but. Um... Okay, so there's a pod that's running uh, the Istio ingress and the Istio egress. So you can actually control traffic out of your um, service mesh as well. Um, and that pod is, it was get fronted by the Istio ingress service, which I'll show you in a second. And then um, the Istio D service, which is basically the Istio control plane. That's like the sort of uh, brains of the operation. Um, it gets run uh, there as well. So it's kind of like constantly monitoring the APIs, the Kubernetes APIs and the Istio uh, systems that are getting deployed and launched and managing all that stuff, all that stuff for you. Now in the Istio namespace, there's also a few services. Um, there's the Istio D service. So again, uh, Envoy proxy is reaching out to Istio D, making communications, trying to figure out what to do um, from time to time. And then the main one we're going to focus on here is the Istio ingress gateway. And you can see, if you're not familiar with uh, Kubernetes services, there's several different types, but one is called load balancer, and it's just like, just like what it sounds like, it's a load balancer. Um, and uh, it's usually a load balancer is going to be externally available, whereas other types of services are internal. Uh, to the cluster, and uh, it's available here on my local host, um, so that's how I'm going to be able to communicate with the app that I have running and show that, but let's look and see what that ingress gateway looks like real quick. I think I have that um, handy. If not, I don't get it. Here it is. Cool. So, this is the uh, the service that runs as the Istio gateway. And what you'll notice if you're familiar with Kubernetes is that it's just plain old service. Um, so this is a Kubernetes object, not an Istio one. Um, oh yeah, sure. Thanks. And let me go ahead and collapse. Let me go the opposite direction. Okay. And uh, it has things like what its IP address is, um, where the traffic goes, um, the ports it's listening on, etc. cetera. Um, all the same things you would do for any other kind of service, but this is all like kind of Kubernetes native that you're seeing here. But there's a few uh, labels that sit here, and these are the ones uh, that are sort of communicating to Istio that this is a service that it should care about. 
and that it's kind of responsible for for managing. Um, and uh, honestly, I'm just being 100% honest. I don't know exactly what all these what all these labels do, <laughs> uh, but basically they're communicating with Istio and telling it to, to manage its uh, manage it and how to manage it, etc. So, of course, you can go to Istio.io and look at all these uh, these details. But but basically, it's a plain old service with some labels. So that's what the ingress gateway looks like. Now let's talk about the. Uh, I'm gonna do it on time. So good, yeah. So now let's look at the uh, what's running in the default namespace, which is where our core services are running. So I'm running this uh, um, I'm running kind of the default Istio demo um, applications here, which is like this book review application, and I'll show you what that looks like in a second. But you can see. Um, a couple things here. One is these are all the services that are serving that application. Um, in fact, let me just let me show you what it looks like so you know what I'm talking about. I got it running. Um, it's just like a bookstore app. It's got some bo books and some names of books and reviews on it, and etc. And it's kind of made up of. Uh, basically three core services. There's a product details page or um, a product detail service that gives you details of a certain book. Um, we have the product page, which is serving the actual HTML um, that we just saw rendered. And then it has uh, a ratings service and then several review services. And you notice there's actually multiple versions of this review service. Um, that's because, uh, well, one of the, the demo is also, we'll show you how you can route traffic between them, but I'm not gonna show that today, but that's um, why there's three different versions, but they're all the same logical service. And you'll notice if I run, you'll notice that uh, it says they're under ready. That shows how many containers are running in the pod. And you'll see that there's uh, two out of two running on each of those uh, services, except for that one at the bottom that says Ubuntu Bastion. And, uh, the reason each of those have two out of two is because Istio has automatically injected the uh, Envoy proxy into those uh, services. So I just actually had to deploy. I'll show you what that looks like. The actual services are just plain old deployments. And you'll notice that in this deployment spec, um, there is nothing about the Istio proxy. Um, it just says, this is my app. This is what's running, et cetera. It's just kind of like a vanilla Kubernetes system. And the reason for that is Istio knows that it will, that anytime a pod is launched in that namespace, it's going to automatically inject the Envoy proxy into it. So this is one of the first really cool things, I think, because now people developing the service, they don't have to know that Istio exists. They just have to build their system the way they would normally do it. They can run it locally like a normal deployment. But when they launch it into this ecosystem, Istio is going to launch that proxy and it's going to become part of that control plane. And that's all because in the namespace, which I uh, got for this YAML here, for the default namespace, we just added this label, Istio injection enabled. And that's all you have to do on a namespace. And every time you launch a pod into that uh, namespace, Istio is automatically going to inject that proxy and start managing all that control, all that data plane uh, stuff for you. <clears throat> So now the Ubuntu Bastion one is a little different because I'm going to demo something here in a second. Um, but let me uh, show you what that looks like. I've actually just explicitly said, I've told Istio, do not inject onto this container. I explicitly said that. So um, Istio is not managing this container right now, or this pod, I should say. So Istio doesn't actually really know about this uh, pod. Um, and it's not controlling any of its traffic, et cetera. Oh, because it's going to be critical to my demo. Uh, so let me uh, let me start generating some traffic um, to this uh, front end page. So I have this uh, script that should be sending traffic. Actually, I think, let me see. I need to source the gateway first. Source, export gateway. 
um, okay, so I'm going to send traffic to this 127.0.180 and in this um, send traffic um, script here, I just have it sending a curl to that gateway URL at the product page, which is that same website that we just saw. And I'm just going to do that in perpetuity so we can start seeing traffic flow to the application. So let me start that up. Okay, so that should start sending traffic. And I'm using Kiali here, which is just like basically a uh, trace routing tool to kind of show how traffic is flowing through this, uh, this service mesh. Um, and I think somewhere in here, it says the, uh, Oops. There, that's what I want to see. So um, you can see here this application, the very first entry point here is the Istio system and the Istio ingress gateway. And then the Istio ingress gateway is sending traffic to uh, the product page service. And that magic is happening because within the... Uh, I've also deployed this uh, gateway. And this gateway that lives in the default namespace, it uses this selector to register itself with the ingress gateway, the Istio ingress gateway. And it says, anything you see on any host that's coming in on port 80, send it to this gateway. And then there's a virtual service that references that gateway. And that's where you add all your routes and um, your service destination. So there's a service, this is a plain old service called product page. If this listed on port 9080, but the flow starts in the Istio system, goes to that ingress gateway, and then it knows to route traffic to this gateway that then sends to the virtual service that then finally sends to the Kubernetes service and then serves the um, traffic from the pod. And I'm gonna, so that's that just kind of shows how that traffic flows. Uh, the rest of it's kind of irrelevant for the purpose of this demo. But I also have this Grafana uh, dashboard up that's showing all the traffic flow um, through the system and kind of the, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm looking at all the traffic coming to that product page service. So the one serving the HTML. And you, what you'll notice here is that, um, you know, you got all this traffic coming in and it's giving you various latency stuff. But the main thing you're seeing here is that all of this, let me zoom in on this. On this board, it shows you that it's all MTLS, and that's because it's reading data from Istio, telling them that all this traffic that's coming to the service is MTLS. It's all MTLS. We're good to go. Blah blah blah. So first, let me pause there. This happens out of the box by default. You deploy Istio into your cluster. You set injection to true, and now all all of your services that are managed by Istio are communicating with each other over mutual TLS. So. Basically, you can do that in like a day. And now every service that ever gets launched into your system, as long as it doesn't explicitly exclude Istio, which I had there a sec, uh, to show you, but uh, will automatically get MTLS. That's like first thing you get out of the box. Simple, easy. Now you have secure end-to-end -end traffic and a secure identity system where these services have to actually prevent search, present certs to each other. So automatically we've like raised our security profile by a thousand percent, basically. That's right. So, yeah, exactly. So the pro so the proxy, so all the traffic in the pod, so you have the pod, you have one pod that sits and then you have the proxy and it, all the traffic comes out of the pod goes to that proxy and that proxy reaches out to Istio D and says, what am I supposed to do here? And it's like, well, you need to pr present a cert. So here's the cert for that service, et cetera. And you can see it knows the names of all these services as well. Um, I don't know, actually. I don't have a good answer for that right now. Um, uh, actually, I'm going to change that. It's negligible. It's fine. Uh, okay. So, um, what I'm going to do now, so this, this is why I have my, um, 
Ubuntu server running. I'm going to exec into that Ubuntu uh, pod. Now, this one is not, remember, uh, managed by uh, Kubernetes. Or, I mean, it's managed by Kubernetes, but it's not managed by um, Istio. And that's why you see only one pod there. So I'm going to exec into that pod. And for those of you who don't know, exec is basically just like SSH for Kubernetes. Man, my, my machine is starting to slow down. Stand by. So when I SSH in here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start sending traffic to that product page service from inside the cluster. So before I was hitting it from my local machine, which is like outside the cluster, and I'm going to start sending the traffic um, internally to the cluster. And um, assuming it like works. Um, and what you're going to see is that you're going to see traffic. Oh, my gosh. What's going on here? Maybe I need to close some stuff out. Um, I'm struggling. Let me close PowerPoint. And uh, one sec. I want to blame Microsoft for this. And, uh, oh, oh, no, not that one. That one. Okay. Don't close that down. All right. We'll see what happens here. I know I should have recorded this. Um, actually, let me, uh, kill Fiali as well. Maybe that's, uh, I'm in trouble. Um, let me uh, close out this starting uh, new shell. Nope, don't do that. Ah. Crap. Just bear with me for a moment while I uh, use the demo gods. Okay, I don't know if this is going to work or not in a timely fashion, so. I'll just explain to you what, what was going to happen here. So when you go into that container that's not managed by um, uh, all right, let's see. Maybe, maybe it's picking back up. Let me try this again. Split. Where's that? Okay, so when I started to send that traffic, um, it wasn't going to be over TLS. And what you would have seen on the Grafana dashboard is uh, it would have shown traffic coming and actually it would have flown. It would have actually gone through um, as plain text and it would have worked. Um, on that Grafana dashboard, you would have seen it show up as unknown because Istio doesn't know what that service is because it's not getting managed by proxy. And the main thing is you would have seen that traffic being allowed. But that's because by default, Istio enforces MTLS, but it only does it in what they call permissive mode, which means that um, it obviously accepts TLS. And it, if it's managing a service, it will um, enforce that TLS. But if a service isn't managed by, um, by Istio, then it will still allow that traffic to come through as uh, when it's in that permissive state. And the way that you would uh, deal with that. Oh my gosh, my computer is really struggling. I wonder if it's struggling with this dashboard, maybe. Let me uh, close out some of these things. Um, there is something called authentication policies, and in particular, one called peer authentication, which I'll show you an example of the YAML. If my computer will just work. Oh. 
Um, come on. this yaml file to open i think that's too much to ask okay so this is something called a peer authentication uh policy and um i didn't deploy it because i was going to deploy it as part of demo but my machine is just like really struggling so um i may not be able to do that um but basically you set the mode as strict and you do that you can actually do it per namespace so some namespaces can be strict others can be permissive permissive um but if you do it at the Istio name system level and you put mode strict, then it will no longer allow any traffic that's not in TLS. So what I was gonna show um, was basically, while it's not being managed by Envoy um, or Istio, why there's no Envoy proxy, it would initially allow that. But then once you apply this uh, policy, just the kubectl apply, then uh, all that traffic gets denied. So now, nothing that's not in TLS. So basically nothing that's not managed by Istio will be allowed to communicate with other services. And then it's just as easy as um, to, to deal with that. It would, it would have just, just been as easy as um, on the bastion that I provisioned, I would just change this from false to true and I'd restart that pod. And then Istio would inject that Envoy proxy and then traffic would start flowing again because it would have in TLS. So um, I think we're getting close on time anyway. And I think my machine is just like really having a hard time today. Oh yeah, no kidding. That's exactly what it's doing. Okay, good call. Um, yeah, I thought I, was getting, I am getting charged, but I guess I was just using too much juice. Yeah, I could try it. Let me, uh, you got one? If I unplug from this, it'll still share. Yeah, it's still in there. No, it's going to Yeah, let me do that. Okay, it's only a three percent. It says it's charging. Let's see if it works. Yeah, well, maybe give it a minute to charge, but um, maybe I can get squeeze on something here at the end. But uh, any questions or points of clarity? Yes. Like the, the NTLS one, you can do it by namespace for sure. So you can specify a specific namespace. Um, I'm not actually sure how you would do it if you wanted to just have some services do it and not others. Um, could be possible. If I would wear a bed, I'd say it was possible, but I'm not sure how to do it. Um, Istio.io is like their main site, and they got a lot of great blogs. So, yeah, do you have some Brett? So. Yeah. Well, here's what I'd say is, um, as with all things like this, like there's a, um, a, a support and maintenance overhead, I guess, you know, and a knowledge overhead, especially if something goes wrong. Um, so that would be my only like caution against it is if, um, if you don't feel like you have the, 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 the people that have the knowledge to be able to deal with it, if, if it goes wrong, but I don't think, I think it's a pretty low barrier for, you know, reasonably good infrastructure engineers to learn, you know, with Istio. Um, and then the other thing, like, for instance, in our, we use Istio, we have a very strict compliance requirements, um, because we're working with you know financial services companies and we have to do that on a startup budget. So 
like we kind of don't have a choice but to use something like Istio because if we were going to do like MTLS, the app layer or something like that, we would just have to hire too many people to make it work. So, um, but I think it's it's pretty low barrier for reasonably good infrastructure people. And uh, uh, I can't, other than those caveats, I'd say not really. Maybe the latency, <laughs> I'm not sure. Yeah, go ahead. So I have another answer to that. So um, if you're using current AWS services that are Kubernetes, so they're going to work. Um, but AWS has their own version of this called Atlas. So it also flows with the AWS services. Okay, cool. I've actually used an AppMesh. Have you used it? I think it's a team that does it. Okay, cool. Yeah. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, create the management. So can you like integrate it with the Istio that you manage yourself? Okay, cool. Because I haven't run it on, okay, I haven't run Istio on VMs, but um, the docs say it's possible. And it makes sense that it would be. I mean, it's just a proxy that sits between the traffic. So it's just, I think like a lot of the advantages of like APIs or Kubernetes and stuff you get out of the box. But that's good. No, I'd like to mess with that some. That was the GPS for Kubernetes. Right. Oh, like their container service. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Any other questions? Is this still that the I think so. I think it's a cloud native uh, project now. Do you know? Does anyone know? Yeah. So I think it's becoming like sort of the standard. No, I don't think so. But I, uh, there's others. There's one called um, I think Simple Mesh. Um, I haven't used that one. I haven't really used any other than Istio. But conceptually, it makes sense that there's probably going to be a ton of them pop up. We'll see who wins. But it seems like Istio is getting the traction. Oh, good point. We'll see. Does anybody on the call have any questions that they'd like to ask? Cool. Um, yeah, I think we're about on time anyway, so. Cool, any other? All right, cool. Well, thanks everyone for coming. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Taking time to listen. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. All right, thanks, Brad. Uh, Do you want to close? Yeah. So we've got another meetup in June, second Wednesday of the month. It's on meetup.com. And we're still okay to meet here, right, Thomas? Yeah. Good. So uh, we'll we'll see everyone next month, RSVP so we can get a good food order. Uh, we'll also do it via Zoom and I'll post this to our YouTube channel once it's uh, finished processing. So thanks everyone. Thanks for coming. Take some home and do Yeah.